sabes que estamos aquí con la gente arrabalera, trasnochadora, gozadora. Havana, a city between two worlds. Have you always driven a taxi? No, just for a year. What kind of motor do you have? Well, I just put a new one in. But is it the same make? A Chevrolet? No, it's a Toyota. Only the exterior is old. I have the old motor at home. Old and new together. That's Cuba. The last island of socialism, at least externally. But the motor of Cuban society has long been capitalist. Yaimi Lai. Havana native and percussionist with the group Synthesis. She's well known beyond Cuba. She's performed all over the world. Yami had plenty of chances to stay abroad, but she always wanted to stay here. Especially now that Cuba is opening up to the U.S. We have high hopes that we'll be able to grow. We were confined to Cuba for too long. Now we're opening up. Especially young people, but they're not the only ones. There's lots of fear about where we're heading, but no one's put any limits on us. Cuba is located in the Caribbean, at the mouth of the Gulf of Mexico. With more than 11 million inhabitants, it's the largest of the Antilles Islands. Cuba is only 170 kilometers away from the United States. Havana's Old Town, a fabulous, if decrepit, open-air museum. Young architects Claudio Castillo and Orlando Inclan are working hard to give their city a future. The state has commissioned them to restore Havana. But the architects are doing this work after their official workday as a second job. Saving this 100-year-old palace is a private project. From their state jobs, the architects earn the equivalent of 40 euros a month. Their private employer on this project pays them many times that. They don't want to say precisely how much. The free market economy has made itself felt everywhere in Cuban society. Without it, the socially conscious architects wouldn't have been able to save one of the most important palaces in the Vieja, or Old Town. On the top floor is a gourmet restaurant, La Guarida. It's a place where a young generation can dream about the future. 
Especially as architects, we're glad to be able to experience this time of change in Cuba. The re-establishment of Cuba's relations with the U.S. will always be positive. It will create better conditions for our city and for our country. The view from the Palace Terrace. Enrique Nunez has been enjoying it for as long as he can remember. Nunez is the restaurant owner and the two architects' employer. He was born in this house and he grew up in it. He's an IT engineer, but he only earns a pittance in his job for the state. One of the best films ever made about Cuba was shot in this building. 1993's Strawberry and Chocolate. The film dealt with homosexuality, a serious taboo. In the early 1990s, after the demise of the Soviet Union and with Cuba descending into poverty, the government allowed a small number of so-called quintapopistas, people who work for themselves. Enrique seized the opportunity and started La Guarida, one of Havana's best restaurants in his house. Enrique's 35 employees are also officially quintapropistas. They receive their wages in foreign currency, which tourists spend in the restaurant. A meal here costs the equivalent of a month's state wages for architects like Claudia and Orlando. It's more profitable to wait on tables. With state wages paid in Cuban pesos, they can hardly afford to buy anything. With foreign currency earned at their side jobs, they can buy all sorts of consumer goods from other cuentapropistas. The parallel economy is a reality in Cuba. Enrique's family's kitchen used to be here in the bar. Havana Vieja looks like a cross between a ruin and a dollhouse. The official task of the team of state architects to which Claudia and Orlando belong is to rebuild the old part of the city. Havana, the former Spanish colonial city and UNESCO World Cultural Heritage Site is a magnet for tourists. Tourism rose 25% in 2015 alone. Lots of people want to experience Cuban socialism before it disappears. Tourism is Cuba's main source of income. Three million visitors bring more than two billion dollars a year into otherwise empty state coffers. Hopes for the future alternate with fear. But everyone knows that after almost six decades of socialism, things are going to change. Even in Havana's luxury neighborhood, the Vedado, the buildings are in terrible shape. Yami Lai shoots videos for her band in the former homes of Havana's wealthy families. Artists, photographers, and film crews gladly pay for a setting like this. The owner is Josie Alonso, a widow. Like all Cubans, she's very resourceful, a true quintapropista. My pension is 270 pesos. That's 10 US dollars. Approximately. 10 or 11. Per month. The electricity alone for the house costs more than that. Without renting the place out, I'd be lost. I don't have the money to renovate the building. And the tourism board didn't want me to. They said even if I only painted it, the tourists wouldn't want to come and take pictures anymore. It's an open secret that many Cuban pensioners don't have enough money to live on. Those who can move in with relatives and rent their apartments to tourists. That brings in seven times the monthly state pension on a single day.
For decades, Cuba has had two currencies. Those who have only Cuban pesos get to stand in line for cheap bread, eggs, and other basics. Those who have cooks, a form of money based on foreign currency, can buy whatever they want on the parallel market. That's led to the formation of social classes in a society where everyone was supposed to be equal. Yaimi still lives with her parents. The entire Lai family are musicians, and Yaimi's grandfather was a famous orchestra conductor. Mercedes, Yaimi's mother, teaches music at school. She boosts her income giving private lessons. For Yaimi, Mercedes is an authority on traditional Cuban music, which Yaimi then gives modern arrangements. <laughs> Yami's band Synthesis is well respected in Cuba and abroad. They combine African music with jazz and rock. Cuban music is arguably the country's leading export product. Music has been a focal point for Cuban society for quite some time. It tells the centuries-old story of the island. The Spanish who colonized Cuba brought slaves from Africa to the island. They were used in agriculture and to do housework in the colonialists' mansions. There was already a feeling of national solidarity in the 19th century, and it fused with the Creole music of the slaves. On the one hand, you had African music, on the other, French, Spanish, and Italian music. French music came with the Haitians, who fled to Cuba after the Haitian Revolution. There are influences from a number of countries, which are all very rich musically. Nonetheless, Yaimi can't live from music alone. Es gibt mittlerweile nur bei Privaten etwas zu mieten. Staatliche Wohnungen gibt es nicht. So kann dich die Miete deinen Monatslohn kosten. La Guarida makes so much money that the owner has hired Claudia and Orlando to renovate the 30 small apartments in the building. The tenants help out. Even before the revolution, people fled the countryside to the cities. People needed apartments. Floors were divided and apartments partitioned in what had been palatial buildings. Nowadays, the inhabitants of the tiny partitioned apartments all have electricity, water, and toilets. <laughs> As well as a job in the restaurant, Veronica, for instance, washes dishes. She's doing pretty well. Shortages are no good. We want our city to flourish. But we can't afford to lose the imagination and creativity that arose from those shortages all these years. Cubans can teach the world to be creative. The 
dawn of the digital age has only made Cubans more inventive. Because of the U.S. trade embargo, there are only a couple of sluggish Wi-Fi networks in all of Havana, and using them is, for most people, prohibitively expensive. Coming to the rescue is Elector Lopez. A year and a half ago, he came up with El Paquete, the package. Elio, a mensajero, Elio, the messenger, as he's known, comes by with the hard disk. It's full of TV shows and miniseries. Dimos Camilo, a mechanical engineer, only has to copy them. The package is chock full, a total of one terabyte of data. El Paquete gives people an unbelievable audiovisual power. El Paquete has everything broadcast in a week on the international channels. All the movies, soap operas, shows, miniseries, and documentaries. All the news, music, apps, and antivirus programs. Every sort of data you can imagine in a week are included in El Paquete. El Paquete is a very clever idea, a kind of Cuban World Wide Web in which foot power, mopeds and delivery trucks cover the distances otherwise bridged by fiber optic cables. Cuba still doesn't have them because of the U.S. embargo. Some 100 people work for El Paquete, that is to say for Elio. Normally it takes an hour to download a single photograph in Cuba. So who downloads a terabyte worth of data for Paquet and gets it to Elio? It's our trade secret who downloads the data. It's for our own protection. We're freelancers, cuenta propistas. But the people who download our data have regular jobs with the state. It's better not to create difficulties for them. It's rumored that high-ranking government officials are involved. Others say that the hard drives are flown in every day from Miami. Every Sunday, El Paquete is transported on a number of hard drives from the Cuban capital to all parts of the island. The main means of transport are long-distance buses, known as guaguas. Other mensajeros are located in provincial towns and cities, and they have other messengers working for them in local villages. Together, they form a comprehensive IT network covering all of Cuba. Following El Paquete is a great way to discover the country, from Baracoa in the southeast of the island to Santiago de Cuba, then into the Sierra Maestra Mountains and back to Havana. The Oriente, the primeval woodlands. This is where explorer Christopher Columbus made landfall in 1492. The aboriginal people who inhabited Cuba back then loved these snails, called polimitas. In contrast to the original Cubans, the polimitas are still alive today. They're endemic to Cuba. They change color depending on where they live. It depends on the climate, the soil, the plant life, and whether they eat fungus or algae. But these colorful creatures are threatened with extinction. Norvis Hernandez, a biologist at the Alejandro de Humboldt National Park, has dedicated her life to saving the polimitas. She's researched their habitat. What temperature suits them best? What's their average size? But while Norvis painstakingly scours the forest collecting information with the help of UN research money, 
Poachers kill the snails and sell their colorful shells for jewelry. Norvis marks the snail's shells. In four days, she'll return to see how far the polymeters have moved. White and yellow snails live here. The rainforest is almost inaccessible during the rainy season. The polymetas live along a broad stretch of coasts with numerous river deltas. The national park encompasses 50,000 hectares. Norva says her work is an adventure as much as a job. With help from the Oro Verde Tropical Forest Foundation in Frankfurt, several biologists work in the national park. It was named after the famous 19th century German scientist and naturalist Alexander von Humboldt. The park contains a greater number of animal and plant species than anywhere else in Cuba. Near the black sand beaches on the southernmost tip of Cuba, Norvis finds red and black polymetas. Yumuri Canyon is a popular tourist destination. There used to be lots of red polymetas here, but the locals have discovered that they can earn good money selling necklaces made of their shells. With tourism came iPhones and other modern things young people want. They're no longer moderate in their wants as they used to be. They're exchanging their Cuban identity for consumerism. My greatest wish for the future is that we preserve the peace we have. Children can play until late at night in the streets. I can go home at 2 o'clock in the morning and nothing happens to me. El Paquete has arrived in Baracoa, Norby's hometown. Baracoa is Cuba's oldest city. It's definitely caught the IT bug. The ideals of the 1959 communist revolution in Cuba are dying. These shops used to make money selling pirated music. Today they live solely from El Paquete. Norvis has copies made of some nature films, mainly by National Geographic. There's not a single family in Baracoa that doesn't get something from El Paqueta. Five pesos, or 30 cents, is what it costs for two hours of entertainment. Betico Gonzalez, the shop owner and an IT specialist by trade, is another Quinta Propista. This customer is having music shows copied for his sister, a Mexican soap opera for his grandmother, and a mafia miniseries from Colombia for his grandfather. His family lives in a remote village in the mountains of the Oriente, the east. El Paquete has penetrated into even the most remote corners of Cuba. That's how strong people's thirst for information is. From Baracoa, it's two hours' drive by Guagua to the village of Pinta. Every Monday, Adniel Matos brings El Paquete here. 
A riverbed is the only route to the house where his grandparents live. Local kids have cobbled together a vehicle to get there. Daniel's 18-year-old sister, Glenor, can't wait. And grandmother Ilda doesn't want to miss anything either. My favorite is La Banda. It's an American show with Ricky Martin. They cast young people from all over the country, including some Cuban exiles. There's a contest, and the five best ones get to form a band. The new band will be coming out soon, and we're all really excited. I'm almost 80, and I'm seeing things I never thought I'd see. We head down the sugarcane route. Santiago de Cuba isn't far from here. <laughs> Images like these could be from the days of the slave trade. This is the soil from which rum and rumba were born. Dancer Yanis Licky Castillo is as famous in Santiago de Cuba as the town's rum is the whole world over. Rum from Santiago de Cuba is a product of various mixtures. The same goes for the music. Yanis Licky dances professionally in the Casino Tropical and privately wherever music is played. In Santiago, that's nearly everywhere. The rum is smooth, just like the Santiaguero. Santiago de Cuba is the island's second largest city and its undisputed capital of rum and music. We don't just bottle alcohol, we bottle the Cuban and his culture. The Internacional is spiced up with some African rhythms. Tropical socialism was always a joyous version of the political ideology. Good cheer is part of Cuban's character, says the Grand Seigneur of Rum, José Pablo Navarra. The Cuban is cheerful by nature, as rum is. And when you hear the conga, you'll see him hopping around. Slaves brought the rumba with them to Cuba. Casa Carib. Diana Slaky and her dance troupe are authentic originals. This is a fertility dance performed for the African gods. The man and the woman act out attraction and rejection. The dance is called the vacuna. It means that if the man catches you, he'll get you pregnant. So the woman has to react to the man's every move and protect herself. In this 
warehouse, which used to belong to the Bacardi family, they still mix rum. The women are apprentices. The men are master rum makers, maestros roneros. Retired engineer Jose Pablo Navarro is the master among masters. Everyone wants to learn the art of rum making from the 73-year-old. Cuban rum is exported to 140 different countries, but not to the U.S. Here's where Ron de Santiago and the famous Havana Club are made. The distillery borders on the poor district of Los Olmos. Many people here work in the distillery and drink its products too. Yanis Lakey says living here is almost like living in Africa. The dancer says she can't exist without music. She gets this sort of music, a favorite among young people, from El Paquete. I like living in Cuba, but I'd like to travel and dance somewhere else for three to six months and then come back. There's no country like Cuba, despite all the problems. Cuba's free. You run around everywhere at any hour of the day and nothing will happen to you. There's no violence. A household of women. The mother works as a cleaner in a school. Yana Sleki dances every Friday in the casino and earns around 20 euros a month. She depends on tips from foreigners. After the meal, she wants to show us the root of rumba and her dance troupe. On the upper floor of the adjacent building, there's an altar of the Santeria religion, which mixes Catholic and African beliefs. Young Cubans also pray to African deities, the Orishas. What are today rituals performed for tourists? Used to be a secret cult on the sugar plantations. This is the origin of rumba. The musicians and dancers perform under the watchful eye of revolutionary Che Guevara with a view of the Sierra Maestra Mountains. The village of San Pablo has its own TV station. The manager of TV Serana is also called Guevara. Luis Guevara. TV Serrana is like a beacon for the inhabitants of San Pablo and many other villages in the Sierra Maestras. Today, we're known all over the world. The station's documentaries have won prizes at international festivals. Carlos Rodriguez is a scriptwriter, Kenya Jimenez, an editor and wife of the manager. 20 people work for the tiny station. My mother is a farmer. 
and my father drove the rural buses, the guaguas. A lot of people in the mountains know him, and that opens a lot of doors for me when I work with farmers. This is the state-run TV set on his motor pool in San Pablo. In the rainy season, many mountain villages are inaccessible even to four-wheel drive vehicles. Nowhere in Cuba is the spirit of the revolution more alive than in the Sierra Maestra Mountains. It was from here that the guerrillas of Fidel Castro and Che Guevara began the revolution that toppled dictator Fulgencio Batista in 1959. We travel for six hours through the coffee plantation with the TV crew, led by a campesino, a landless farmer. Our destination is the last village in the mountains. Hola. The TV crew is making a documentary about the village of Cirugia. It was planned by Fidel Castro and built by 30 families who had been scattered throughout the mountains. The achievements of Cuban socialism are still important to these coffee bean farmers. Socialism brought education and medical care for their children and a way out of the poverty of their pre-revolutionary lives. Today, they tell Carlos Rodriguez, a TV Serena journalist, that they have to sell coffee on the black market because the state prices for it are too low. Gilberto Veracia helped build this village. Today, he's worried that the young people will all leave, as they did in neighboring villages. The people leave the villages because transport is really bad, and the price of coffee, from which these people live, was too low in recent years. The people of Cirugia don't want to leave their village. They want to stay, but under better conditions. Better connections with the cities, better streets and better buses. Farmer Roberto Jerez has to sell 90% of his crops to the state for fixed prices. In response to pressure from farmers, the state is now paying them better. His daughter Lisette's family also lives from coffee growing. You can't say that life is hard here. I have two children, and at harvest time, I have enough money. It's just that when it's not harvest time, many people are out of work and struggling to make ends meet. Cirugia interests Carlos because the villagers live almost independently and have fought back against perceived injustice. There is even a public telephone that can be used to call a helicopter in case of an emergency where the village doctor doesn't know what to do. This school teacher is a passionate defender of the revolution. She teaches her students revolutionary values as if the uprising had only happened yesterday, as if elsewhere in Cuba things were not changing at a breathtaking pace. Here older people's hearts still skip a beat when they think back to the revolution and have mixed feelings about the country opening up. What does that mean? diplomatic relations. The U.S. aren't going to give back Guantanamo or lift the trade embargo. Everything will stay the same. To have a bit of prosperity in the modern world, we have to sacrifice social equity. Cuba has begun to do this. It's very risky, but we have no choice but to try. Back in Havana, where the streams of tourists to the last island of socialism continue to flow and money is becoming more and more important. 
Pensioner Josie Alonso is looking forward to a group of visitors from the U.S. Americans are only allowed to travel to Cuba directly from the U.S. if they claim they're going for purposes of study. But the Cubans can find a way around that. A son of the maximum leader, Alex Castro, is here. Fidel Castro's son is a professor of photography in Havana. His presence turns this clutch of tourists into a study group. If you like, if you like, if you like, I think it would be smart, maybe take five minutes and walk around the house so you see a right what's available. You can go upstairs and... These Americans take possession of Josie's house. They love Cuba's ruins and the sense of nostalgia the whole country emanates. In all probability, Alex Castro is here not just as the teacher of a photography course, but also as a cuenta propista. I live in a magical world and everything is a mystery to me, run the lyrics of one Cuban song. The architects Claudia and Orlando are finishing up a new private gallery. The works here show an extraordinarily fresh view of traditional revolutionary symbols. The gallery belongs to one of the stars of Strawberry and Chocolate, actor Jorge Pergoria. Here, there's a strong scent of the future in the air. Life is a dialectic. That's Marxism. Everything changes. Cuba smells like the future.